Hello and good time of day to you. I've been working on repairing this 48k issue 3B ZX Spectrum. If you've watched the final few parts of my previous Spectrum repair video, number 7, then you'll probably recognise that I've connected a logic analyzer to this computer in exactly the same way as I had before, and I've been using that to help me diagnose what was wrong with this. Now when I first looked at the information collected by the analyzer, I thought the CPU had developed a very strange and highly unusual fault. However, on closer investigation that turned out not to be the case, and this computer merely had a few rather mundane, very common faults. So I'm not going to talk about that today. However, I thought it would be interesting to have a closer look at the first few steps taken by the computer when it switched on, and how knowledge of that can help diagnose faults. Here's a disassembly of part of the ROM's contents. Shown are the instruction mnemonics, along with the address of each instruction, its opcode, and any related data, all in hexadecimal. I've added decimal line numbers to make it easier for me to reference any particular instruction. Once the Z80 CPU is reset, which happens at switch on due to its reset input being held low for a moment by capacitor C27, its program counter is set to zero, and execution begins at line 1. The first instruction disables interrupts. This is necessary because the interrupt mode hasn't been set, and none of the system variables have been initialized, so there's no point in having any interrupt routine executed 50 times every second, which would otherwise happen because of the interrupt signal generated by the ULA. The next instruction sets the accumulator to zero. This flags to a later part of the initialization code that the computer has just been switched on, rather than is being reinitialized due to the basic command new being entered. When the new command is used, the accumulator is loaded with FF and a jump made to the code beginning at line 10. When this flag is FF, certain system variables are retained through the reinitialization. At line 3, register pair DE is loaded with FFFF. This is the highest possible RAM address in the 48k ZX spectrum. The jump instruction at line 4 transfers execution to address 11CB, line 10. Next, the initialization flag is saved in register B as the accumulator is required for other purposes. The instructions at lines 11 and 12 write the value 7 to the ULA's I.O. port. This turns the display's border white. It's useful to know this when diagnosing a faulty spectrum. If the border always turns white at startup, then you know the CPU, ROM and ULA are very likely all at least partly working and are able to communicate with each other. The next two instructions load the interrupt register with the value 3F. I'm not sure why this is done. I don't believe the Spectrum uses interrupt mode 2, but presumably it requires this value in this register for some reason. However, it doesn't affect the next few actions. They then follow a number of no operation instructions, presumably to introduce a short delay. I don't know why this is necessary, but I imagine it was found that the RAM isn't always fully functional so soon after switch on. At lines 17 and 18, the value FFFF is copied from DE to register pair HL. The loop composed of the instructions at line 19 to 22 writes the value 2 to all possible RAM addresses, starting at address FFFF and working its way down to 4000. 16,384 in decimal. Note that if this code is being executed because of the basic new command, a slightly smaller section of memory will be filled, but here we'll only concern ourselves with what happens when the computer is first switched on. The loop termination condition arises when the H register holds the value 3F, and this happens when the pair HL contains 3FFF, having just been decremented from 4000 by the instruction in line 20. Remember that the accumulator still holds the value 3F, having been loaded at line 13, and it's with this that register H is compared at line 21. When these two are equal, the zero flag becomes set, and so the conditional jump relative instruction at line 22 does not cause a jump, and execution then continues to line 23. At this point, every functioning byte of RAM in the computer should contain the value 2. This includes the area that holds the display data, and it's this process, followed by what happens next in the RAM read section, that causes the paper area of an initialising spectrum's display to normally turn black with a brief flash of thin vertical lines. 
The purpose of all this is to determine the highest address at which there is working RAM. The result should be 7FFF or FFFF, depending on whether it's a 16 or 48k spectrum. Any other outcome means something is wrong, though the firmware doesn't recognize this and take any special action. This result later gets stored in the system variable PRAMT. Another loop begins with the instruction at line 23, and A is used for its side effect of clearing the carry flag. Instructions at line 24 and 25 subtract the value in register pair DE from that in the pair HL, and then add it back, leaving the value in HL unchanged. However, the subtraction results in the carry flag being set if the value in HL is less than that in DE. The first time these instructions are executed, HL should hold 3FFF and DEFFFF as it has since almost the very beginning, so the carry flag does get set. The increment instruction in line 26 increases the value held in HL by 1, so on the first time around the loop, HL then holds the address of the first byte of RAM, 4000. The conditional jump relative instruction at line 27 is one way the loop can be terminated, which happens when HL contains FFFF when the instruction at line 24 is executed. Note that in this case, the increment instruction at line 26 causes the value in HL to wrap around and become zero, but the carry flag isn't affected, and so the loop is still terminated by a jump to the instruction at line 32. Finally, we arrive at the point of all this, the examination of the functional status of the RAM. The instruction at line 28 reduces the value of the byte pointed to by HL by one. This should result in the value 1 being written to the address in question, all RAM locations having been filled with the value 2 earlier. Should some fault mean this instruction reads a value of 1 and so reduces it to 0, then the 0 flag is set and the loop terminated by the instruction at line 29, causing a jump to line 32. The instruction at line 30 again reduces the value at the address held in HL by 1. So the 1 that had just been put there is changed to 0, causing the 0 flag to be set. However, should a fault mean that this instruction will choose a value other than 1, then of course subtracting 1 from it does not produce 0, and so the 0 flag is not set. This is also the case if the spectrum is a 16k model, and HL points to an address where there is no RAM. All such addresses usually appear to contain the value FF because of pull-up resistors connected to the data bus. Provided the 0 flag was set, the instruction at line 31 returns execution to line 23, and the loop is repeated. HL gets increased by 1, and the next highest address is tested. However the instruction at line 32 is reached, HL then points to the address of a faulty byte of RAM, or an address where there is no RAM, or contains 0 because all RAM addresses were tested without error, the 0 having been produced by adding 1 to FFFF at line 26. In all cases, subtracting 1 from the value in HL, as the instruction at line 32 does, results in the highest address at which there is working RAM. Knowing this, the firmware then goes on to set up the system variables and starts the basic programming environment. Note that this test of the RAM isn't particularly thorough, and so it isn't at all unusual for it to fail to recognize faulty RAM, causing the computer to go on and crash. If the routine does detect faulty RAM, but at the very first address in lower RAM, or at an address not much higher, the computer then attempts to establish the basic system environment at addresses in the ROM, which of course fails, and again the computer crashes. In the case of a spectrum that fails to initialize, or sometimes when it does but then malfunctions, and it's suspected this is due to faulty RAM, using a logic analyzer to observe what happens as the CPU executes these RAM tests is one method that can often reveal the cause of the problem. This is the logic analyzer client software. I've set up some annotations appropriate for the signals its inputs are connected to. You can see those down the left. The two summary lines show the values on the data bus and the address bus at any particular time. Due to some oddities in this software, it often appends a number of unwanted zeros to the address, but we can just ignore those. I'm going to start by capturing what the CPU in this computer does from the moment it's switched on, or at least from the moment it begins to execute the code in the ROM, just so we can make sure the disassembly is correct and the computer starts off behaving in the way we expect it to.
Here I've already set up the trigger conditions so that the analyzer should begin collecting data when the address bus holds the value 11CB, which is line 10 of the disassembly, and the data bus hexadecimal 47, which is the opcode of the instruction at that address. It's also going to check some of the control signals and look for read being low, remember it's an active low signal, write being high, memory request low, and IO request and refresh both high. That should cause the analyzer to trigger when the CPU executes the instruction at line 10 in the disassembly. I've noticed that quite often when first switched on, the CPU begins executing the first two instructions and then resets and goes through and does them, does them again, and that can happen several times over. And so it's better to start the capture a little way into the execution to avoid that confusion of the first few instructions being repeated. So I've set the analyzer waiting for the trigger condition, and hopefully it will trigger if I switch the computer on, which I'll do now. The vertical white line marks the trigger time, and we can see at this point the CPU was retrieving a value from memory that is indicated by the read and memory request control signals being low. We can also see it retrieved the hexadecimal value 47 from address 11CB. So that's the opcode of the instruction at line 10 of the disassembly, and that's the trigger condition I set up. I've also created the cyan cursor to label this instruction. I've added cursors for a few other notable points, so if I scroll over to the left, to so time a bit before the trigger time, then the first cursor here is when the CPU retrieved the very first instruction from address 0, that's the instruction at line 1 of the disassembly. I've also labelled the retrieval of the next few instructions. The instruction here at line 3 loads register pair DE with the value FFFF, so we see the opcode for that, 11 hexadecimal being retrieved here, followed by at this point where the pointer is, and again here, a read of the two data bytes FF. You'll notice that in between the retrieval of the instructions and any associated data, other values often appear on the data and address buses. This is because of the action of the CPU's dynamic RAM refresh feature, which is active when the refresh control signal is low, and we can ignore what's happening at these times. Scrolling ahead a little, this cursor here marks the retrieval of the instruction at line 19 in the disassembly, and this is the start of the loop that fills all possible RAM addresses with the value 02. So at this time the value hexadecimal 36 is retrieved, that's the opcode for the instruction to load the address that's pointed to by the register pair HL with the following data, and that's the value 02, which is retrieved here. And then we see the very first write performed by the CPU during this initialization sequence, and that's here, where the value 02 is written to address FFFF. So that's all as we'd expect it to be. I've deliberately introduced a fault that causes this spectrum to fail to initialize properly. Here's what appears on the display when it's switched on. Back to the Logic Analyzer software. I've changed the trigger conditions so that now the analyzer should trigger when it detects the CPU retrieving the instruction decrement HL at address 11EF, that's line 32 of the disassembly. When this instruction is reached, it means the RAM read loop that tests the RAM has finished. That may be because it successfully tested all RAM addresses, or because it's detected a fault. So I'll start the capture, now the analyzer is waiting for the triggered condition to occur, and I'll briefly turn the computer on. Again I've saved you the boredom of watching me create cursors to mark points of interest, but that's what I've done. And as before the white vertical line marks the trigger point. This is when the CPU retrieved the instruction at 11EF, that's line 32 in the disassembly, and that means that the preceding RAM read loop has just terminated. So if we scroll a little bit to the left, 
we should be able to see what happened immediately before that. At this point here, where the pointer is, the instruction at line 30 in the disassembly was retrieved. This instruction retrieves the byte at the memory address pointed to by register pair HL, subtracts 1 from it, and then writes it back to the same address. So here we see that the value FD was retrieved from address 4000, that's 16384 decimal, and is the very first byte of RAM in the computer, it's in the lower RAM. 1 was subtracted from FD, producing FC, which was written back to the same address, here. If we scroll a little further left, we'll find the instruction at line 28 of the disassembly, and here again, the value at the address pointed to by register pair HL should be reduced by 1, and it should be the same address, 4000, as indeed it is, we can see that down here. And this time the value 0 was retrieved. When 1 was subtracted from that, it wrapped around and became FF, and we see here that FF was written back to that same address. Now the value 0 should not have been retrieved here, because the preceding RAM fill routine should have written the value 0, 02 to all possible RAM addresses. Similar problem arises here, because although FF was written to address 4000. When the instruction at line 30 was executed, the value FD was retrieved. I also want to confirm that the value 02 was originally written to this address, and because of the order in which these tests are carried out, that is, the RAM is filled starting at the highest possible address, going all the way down to the lowest address and then tested in the reverse order, the point at which 02 was written to address 4000 should also be in this capture. And I found that here. So this is the opcode for the instruction that performs that write being retrieved. That's line 19 in the disassembly. Here's the associated data byte 02 being retrieved. And then here, well, we can see the write control line was low for a moment. The value 02 was written to address 4000. So moving back to here, this is again the instruction at line 28. We know that the value 2 was written to address 4000. So either the RAM didn't correctly store that value, or something went wrong when it was read back. Now the only difference between 0, 02 and 00, 00 is in bit position 1, and we can see here that of course data line D1 is low when it should have been high. Scrolling a bit further right, this is that same instruction where it writes FF back to the same address. And then over here, where FD is retrieved. Again, the difference between FF and FD is only in bit position 1, so FF has all bits set, but FD has bit 1 unset, and of course here we see that data line D1 was low, when we would have expected it to be high, because FF was written to that address earlier. Here's the 48k spectrum circuit diagram. Things to note here are the CPU, the ROM, the ULA, the lower RAM, the upper RAM, and the data bus, which connects the CPU to the ROM, the upper RAM, and to the lower RAM, and to the ULA. Note it's split in half by a set of resistors in series with each data bus line. If you want to know more about the reason behind that, watch the video I've made called ZX Spectrum Hardware Description. Now the fault is detected by the RAM test routine while it's testing an address in the lower RAM. It's also the very first address it tests, so it's difficult to know whether the fault is specific to that address, or specific to the lower RAM, or would affect all addresses. However, bit position 1 of all bytes in the lower RAM is provided by IC7, so it's certainly possible there's something wrong with that.
Another possibility is that something else connected to data bus line D1 is corrupting the state on that line at times when it shouldn't, and that would prevent the correct value from being written to IC7 or being read from IC7 or perhaps both. There are many possible candidates here. It could be the ULA or the ROM. It could be an internal fault in the CPU, although that's not very likely. We've already seen that it's correctly executing instructions from the ROM, so there's probably nothing wrong with that. Finally, it could be one of the upper RAM ICs, and the one that connects to data bus line D1 is IC16. Upper RAM faults are fairly common in spectrums, so that also has to be a prime suspect. I've repeated the previous capture, and the result is more or less exactly the same as it was the first time. However, now I've got the two previously unused inputs of the logic analyzer connected to pin 2 of IC16 and pin 2 of IC7. IC16 is the upper RAM IC that provides bit position 1 of every byte of upper RAM, and IC7 similarly provides bit 1 of every byte in the lower RAM. I've jumped straight to the point where the CPU retrieved the instruction at line 28 of the disassembly. We can see that here where the pointer, so the value 35, the opcode for that instruction, is retrieved. Then moving to the right, as a result of that instruction, the CPU retrieved the value 0 from address 4000. We're expecting it to retrieve 2 here because that's the value that was written earlier during the RAM fill loop. And if we look down here at the logic value on the output of IC7 at that time, then it was high. This suggests that address 4000 really did hold the value 2, but for some reason that didn't make it to the CPU. So, subtracting 1 from 0 caused a wraparound and resulted in the value FF being written back to that same address. As an aside, I note here that where the opcode for the conditional jump relative instruction at line 29 is retrieved, if it was so designed, the CPU could then not bother to retrieve the next byte that contains the jump offset, because this zero flag is not set and the jump isn't going to happen, but it retrieves the offset anyway. Scrolling a bit further to the right, we find the next instruction at line 30, which again decrements the value at the address pointed to by register pair HL. Here FD is read from 4000. We would have expected FF to be read. And again we see here pin 2 of IC7 was high at that time. However data bus line D1 was not. Now all this suggests that IC7 is probably not faulty and that the problem is caused by something connected to the upper half of the address bus, most likely IC16, because it's very common for a faulty upper RAM IC to cause this type of problem. Let's see what's causing this fault. IC16 is missing. Instead, where it should be, I fitted a 100 ohm resistor, connecting data bus line D1 to the 0 volt power supply rail. This simulates a faulty upper RAM IC that perhaps has developed a partial short circuit between its data output and one of its power supply connections, or perhaps one that attempts to assert a value on the data bus at times when it shouldn't. Quite often, the faulty IC isn't able to drive the bus hard enough to prevent the ROM or the CPU from setting it to whatever state they desire. However, the resistors that divide the data bus into two halves mean that when the CPU attempts to retrieve a value from the lower RAM or from the ULA, then the state of the affected data bus line is controlled by the faulty upper RAM IC rather than the correct value on the lower half of the data bus. This type of fault can be very difficult to discover without the use of a logic analyzer, although it can also often be revealed by using an oscilloscope to simultaneously examine the state of the upper and lower halves of each data bus line. 